Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I'm hesitant to say this. I just don't feel quite ready, but Happy New Year, I guess. <laughs> Happy New Year. Um, I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas. It was so fun to be in this room and celebrate with you last, uh, last Sunday, which feels like a long time ago. But uh, it was just a week ago, and it was wonderful, and we were really um, glad to celebrate with you. I hope you had a wonderful week. Just quickly for, for us, we were super busy leading up to Christmas. We had a little bit of family time. We, uh, we spent Christmas uh, evening with uh, my dad's side of the family, and then when they all left, I got, like, deathly ill. Uh, like, couldn't stop coughing. I had this fever. And then my entire family left for three days to go see other family, and so I spent, like, three days on the couch wondering if I was going to live. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, so the, the good news is, at least for some of you, that I did, and here I am. And, um, but what it allowed me, spending three days considering life and all of those sort of things, laying on the couch, uh, it, it, it led me to like a, a lot of reflection, which, if you know, can be a really good thing, but also when you're like sitting there and reflecting and you're wondering if you're going to live and all those kind of things, it can be a hard thing to be in reflection and, and, to, and to think through those things. But um, it ended up being a really good uh, a time for me. And as Christy talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, if I take more sips of tea this morning, it's because I was wondering if I was going to live three days ago. Um, <clears throat> but um, as Christy talked about, transitions are these amazing built-in times in our calendar and in our rhythm for reflection. And New Year's is one of those amazing times. But um, transitions are, are just sort of built for reflection, whether it's a new job or it's a, the start of something, it's a new season, it's a, a, a the beginning of a relationship, a, a season, a, a break, a milestone of some sort, a birthday anniversary, whatever it may be, like, th- we have these things that have built-in times for reflection. And New Year's is one of those times, but it's, it's like kind of elevated in a lot of ways. And as Christy said, you all know about New Year's resolutions. I was surprised to read this week that only 40% of people make New Year's resolutions. Is that surprising to anybody else? Yeah. Thank you. At least one of us, two of us think it's surprising. And I wondered, I, like I, I had lots of questions about this. I, I, I started questioning the research and all that kind of stuff. But I wondered if people didn't admit to making them because only 9% of them actually fail. Like they, they all fail, basically. 91% fail, only 9% are successful. So I wondered if most people just said they don't make them because they didn't want to live with that. But that's beside the point. I think it has to do with demographics and the, there's more new generations that don't fall into the baby boomer and before. That's a very good hypothesis. I, I would go with that too. That, I, you, you sold me. Um, <laughs> there, there's, there's a lot of research around resolutions. And, um, but one of the thing that is true, one thing that is true about resolutions is there has to be some awareness or reflection of the present or the past, right? Not many people just say, I'm going to do something new without considering what has been done, what is old, right? It's, it's saying, I want to change something about my present, or I want to change something about my past, and I want to do something new about it. And so in my reflection, my life and death reflection this week, I was thinking about um, just, the, just all of the things that happened uh, in our family this year, and really just the things, right? Like, there was so much that happened, and so just a few of them. We welcomed our fourth child at the beginning of the year. You got to meet him a couple weeks ago. Uh, my wife, Monica, who was up here leading worship this morning, and by the way, do you, do you know that all of them were volunteering this morning? It's pretty amazing, yeah. We have a really, really amazing team uh, but Monica, on top of her full-time job and volunteering and all the other things she does, she began two new advisory roles uh, that we're really excited about. Uh, it was my first full year of master's work uh, in seminary, which was just so, 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 so much reading and wonderful reading. Um, we basically moved into the Little League field for six months because three of our four kids were playing baseball. And I am proud to announce that the A Union Little League Phillies won the championship. We ventured into a, becoming a soccer family for the first time. I'll leave it at that. Uh, our, oldest, <laughs> our oldest entered the world of acting 
this year, and she did her first play, and she was awesome at it, and that was super fun. As a family, we did a three-week trip internationally, which was awesome and wonderful, and it, it, it's full of stories that I'm sure I'll say at some point. But when I was thinking about this last year, there's this tension of, man, how did we get here already? And we did a lot of stuff in 365 days. And, so, and I remember sort of thinking about these tensions and holding them differently. And then there's this one side of just the sheer celebration of so much good stuff. Like so much to be thankful for, so many fun things. And then thinking back on some of those seasons and being like, man, the calendar really just carried me through. And I'm not sure I was really even present for the moments, right? But just here we are at the start, can't wait till the end, and the calendar just pulled. And I remember a professor I had at Biola, he used to always say, don't live parenthetically. And the whole idea was, don't just look forward to the next thing because you'll miss out on what's right in front of you. And I think this is the, this is the risk, right, of, of being busy or of calendars or of all these things. They're really, really good things, but one of the risks is that we can miss what's in front of us. So we have these personal things, we have our personal experiences, we have the, the wonderful personal lives that we live and all of this stuff, but then when you throw in the external circumstances, things that you don't have any control over, the stuff that just happens in the world. This year was a fairly crazy year if you look at it from that perspective. There's wars around the world that continue in Sudan, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Ethiopia, Myanmar, just to name a few. New wars started when Hamas attacked Israel in southeastern Nigeria. And then you look at all the headlines, right? There's the, the worry about artificial intelligence. There's inflation and economic instability. There's global political tensions. There's global temperatures that are shattering records. And let alone the looming U.S. presidential election. Right? When you have the external circumstances paired with the daily realities of our lives, however good they may be, the risk is that it pulls us into this idea of just drifting. And Dale always talks about, the, he, he always says that shif, uh, ships don't drift into ports. Ships don't just drift into safety. They either drift out to sea or they drift into rocks. And so we talk about this a lot, but the reality is I, I don't think anybody wants to just drift. As followers of Jesus, we especially don't want to drift. We want to be rooted. We want to be grounded. We want to be intentional with the lives we've been given. And it's a discipline to live that way, right? It's a discipline to live that way. So we, we don't just wake up one day and pull up from the, the current of the calendar or the, the tide of the time that's just pulling us along and just pull up one day and be like, wow, how did we get here? And so I think one of the ways to address this question is to, is to ask ourselves, who do I want to be? And given today and the reality that it's a significant day to reflect, to ask the question even more specifically, who do I want to be in 2024? Back in October, uh, Russell Moore, who's the editor-in-chief of Christianity Today, he wrote an article just sort of thinking about the, the coming year from a political perspective. And he wrote it about politics, but I think it's so much bigger than that. He says this, none of us can prepare for 2024, and if by prepare we mean to check off all the steps that can keep us from the mistakes and traumas of years past. That's because no one knows what is out there ahead of us waiting for us in 2024. Here's what you can do, though. You can prepare yourself to step into the mystery of whatever will be 2024. What I mean is that you can start to prepare yourself to be the kind of person who can handle it, whatever it is. And I love his exhortation because we don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what tomorrow brings. And we certainly can't control it. But we can control how we respond to it. We can control who we are in the midst of it. And Jesus talked about this idea as well. He talks about it in John 16. He talks about it in Mark 13. And we're going to revisit this in uh, just a couple months. We're going to come back to the book of Mark but just briefly, in Mark chapter 13, Jesus begins to give insight into the end times. And he's talking about some very specific things that are going to happen, but I think he's also talking about just the reality, the general state of the world moving forward. 
I'm not going to read all this, but we'll, we'll just summarize it really quick. He says, watch out, because all sorts of people are going to come. All sorts of false teachers are going to come, and they're going to try and deceive you. He said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There will be civil wars. There's going to be natural disasters. He says, be on guard because all of those things that I taught you, all of those things I warned you about, as followers of Jesus, you're going to be arrested. You're going to suffer. But he says, rely on the Holy Spirit. He says, families are going to disintegrate. People are going to hate each other, but stand firm. I don't know if that sounds familiar to you, if that sounds like maybe a picture of the culture that we live in. It sounds kind of familiar to me. But the reality is that no one knows what's ahead in the next year or even tomorrow, but Jesus says regardless of whatever year number it is, it's never going to be easy. But he says to stand firm. Determine who you want to be when it comes and stand firm. This made me think of Paul's final commendation to Timothy in his, in his first letter. In 1 Timothy 6, Paul's writing to Timothy, he's pastor to pastor. He's writing as a mentor to his friend. Timothy's there trying to keep the church together, this growing new church. He's trying to keep it together. And Paul ends it by saying, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed, and in so doing, have departed from the faith. Grace be with you all. The opposing ideas falsely called knowledge that Paul is talking about is a movement that started in the first century called Gnosticism. And it, it sort of became this big thing in the second and third centuries, and then it sort of fizzled out as a formal movement. But the, the idea of it, the concepts of Gnosticism, live on and have lived on throughout all of time. And we know it as different things. We know it as different ideologies. Some may even call it tribalism today. But the whole idea is that the material world is evil, and if you wanted to escape it, you could achieve that by a secret knowledge. Certain people could achieve freedom from the evil of the world by a secret knowledge. And so if this sounds familiar to you, if, if you have experienced anything like this, like if you think the same way I do, you're in. If you vote the same way I do, you're in. If you believe the same thing, you're in. If you hold the same secret knowledge I do about whatever given topic it is, we're good, but if not, we're not. And Paul is warning, this is not what the faith is. N.T. Wright says it like this. He says, the faith, genuine faith in God as the good creator of the good world and in Jesus as the beginning of the new creation leads in an entirely different direction. It doesn't lead to secret knowledge and tribalism. The genuine faith that Paul's talking about leads to grace. So 2024 isn't going to be any more uncertain than any other year. But the kind of people we are in the midst of whatever comes this next year, we can stay anchored no matter how choppy the water may get. We can stay stable no matter how shaky the ground becomes. And the way we respond, the way we react, the way we treat other people can point as a signpost to the one who creates that security. It can point as a signpost to the one who we have that faith in to begin with. And so I, I don't mean to paint this like awful picture of, of the next year. You, I, you may be here today and saying, I cannot wait for tomorrow and I cannot wait for everything that the year has to bring. And I love that. I, I am sort of looking forward to the next year too. <laughs> no, I am. I'm looking forward to it. So I'm not, I'm not trying to say that it's all bad. It's like there's no good in tomorrow. But I'm saying that whatever it is, we can determine who we want to be and how to respond in the midst of it. And so what I wanted to do for the rest of our time this morning is just to reflect on our past year here together. Um, because we've taught, we've looked at, we've read, we've prayed on, about, and we've done some significant things in this room over the past 52 weeks. And I think in many ways, if we look at it as a whole, it can serve as sort of a, a starting place, a foundation that we could build off of for who we want to be in 2024. And, and certainly God is our ultimate foundation. We want to be like Jesus. I, I don't want to say anything other than that. But sometimes when we look at Jesus' commands to stay firm, to be on guard, to watch out, Sometimes we need some adjectives and some descriptives to hold on to and to anchor us to those commands. And so that's what I want to do. Um, I want to 
I want to try and summarize the entire year of teaching in five minutes, okay? I think I can do it. Um, so that's first. And then I want to propose to you a single sentence that could summarize the entire year of teaching that we looked at. And I think that sentence can serve as an anchor point or a foundation for who we want to be. And then I want to close by um, how we can very practically begin to do this together. So if you have your handout, you should, because every, there was one on every chair. My kids put them on your chair this morning. And you should have a pen. There's some blanks there. And it probably doesn't make any sense to you yet, and that's okay. But there's some blanks there. And I'm going to tell you sort of when you can fill it in. And then when we get to the end, we'll have this, we'll have this picture together, okay? So if you want to time me, Go ahead. But here's my five minutes, okay? So Advent. We just ended Advent season. We looked at the promise of an honest Advent, <clears throat> that God became one of us and is still with us. And we use this quote as sort of our guiding principle. We can look to the candles, songs, and pageantry to help us continue, connect to the, to the divine. But we can also look to pregnancy, biology, history, and mystery as sacred meeting places with the incarnation of Christ. We saw that the story of Christmas is one of courage. That's your first blank. It's one of courageous acts. It's one of deep faith and obedience, one of vulnerability and mess, one of trust and deep hope. Prior to that, we did a series called Transform, and we looked at the reality of living a life transformed by the Holy Spirit. We use this quote from Dallas Willard as our guide. It says, we don't believe something by merely saying we believe it or even when we believe that we believe it. We believe something when we act as if it were true. And if you remember the transformation triangle, right? It had three, three points and then a center. We acknowledge that transforma transformation happens by being anchored in truth. Truth being scripture and looking to Jesus as the embodiment of truth as our example. We talked about community and the reality that the words that we say to each other have profound impact on our transformation as people. We talked about the practices Practicing the way of Jesus, prayer, fasting, and Sabbath, to name a few, is what makes room for the Holy Spirit to do that work in our lives. And, and then at the center is the Holy Spirit, the very agent of transformation in our lives. So your second blank is transformed, if you want to write that in there. Before that, we spent the summer looking at uh, a couple of chapters in the book of Mark. We looked at what Jesus actually said and what he did. And most recently, we looked at this section in the book of Mark that was sort of centered on this theme of the cost of the kingdom. It started, if you remember, with Peter's confession that Jesus was the Messiah. And the very next thing that Jesus said is, in chapter 8, 34, he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. That's your next blank, is disciples of Jesus. But the next several weeks and chapters we saw over and over again in Jesus' teaching and in his actions, his modeling of this, that the cost, that the way of the kingdom is not the way of the world. Power is not used over people. Power is given away. He says to the disciples, if you want power, you must become a servant. He goes as far to say to become a slave. Looking at the least powerful in that society, the women and the children, he says to them, these are who the kingdom belongs to. We talked about not causing others to stumble. Again, taking our role in community seriously. The words that we say to people, the way that we treat each other is significant. Ultimately, that the cost of the kingdom is to deny the way of the world and to follow the way of Jesus. In the spring, we talked about living with emotionally healthy, there's your next blank, emotionally healthy relationships. We use the thesis statement from Peter Cazero's book, and he says, emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable. It is not possible for a Christian to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. We looked at a lot of things over the course of the series, and I will do my best to summarize it, but we, looked, we started by acknowledging and challenging our expectations, both our expectations on ourselves and our expectations on others and our expe expectation toward God. We looked at the story of Joseph and how family patterns have significant impact in our lives, but that God's transformative love can reinterpret those stories. Emotional health comes when we can acknowledge the influence of our past, but allow God's love to reinterpret those for spiritual growth. We talked practically about listening well, and we looked at several examples of how Jesus, Jesus just listened by being present. We talked about integrity, which ultimately led to an examination of identity, which is the truest thing about us. We said that the truest thing about us is our union with Christ, and God's mission is to integrate that identity 
in every aspect of our life. And then lastly, we looked at the idea of peacemaking, building off that reality of identity that the truest thing about us is our union with Christ, knowing that we can go into conflict and out of conflict, trusting that God is with us, and that the goal of emotional health is to bring real peace to everyone involved. We looked at the book of Ecclesiastes, being aware that the the way of the world is vapor. That's the next blank for you, aware of the vapor. We looked at the wisest, the words of the wisest man to ever live, and we saw that the call of Ecclesiastes is to evaluate the pursuit of the way of the world, the material success or the conventional wisdom, and instead find meaning and contentment in the recognition of life's inherent value as a gift from God. But secondly, we saw that there are two ways of looking at things. There's the under the sun perspective, if you remember, and this is the perspective that's isolated from God, and it's what leads the writer to say everything is meaningless. However, we saw that in the conclusion of Ecclesiastes, the way to combat this wariness and hopelessness is to fear God and to keep his commandments. In the midst of that, we had our night of vision and prayer. Right in this room, we filled the room, we prayed, we worshiped, and God, uh, Dale shared his heart to rebuild our church and to renew as a community. He talked about it as increased engagement by serving and giving, knowing and loving each other, and clear steps to becoming like Jesus. And so that's your next blank, is to be seeking renewal. We talked about this idea that personal renewal leads to corporate change. Before that, we had Dave Lomas here, and he was here with us for two Sundays and a Wednesday night, and we talked about this idea of a biblical ethic for sexuality. We came away with a broader understanding, but even maybe more encouraging was his exhortation to be known by what we're for, which is your next blank, to be known by what we're for more than just what we're against. Prior to that, we took a few weeks to look at Mark, and in that section, we were looking specifically at a theme of Jesus' authority. We saw that Jesus didn't point to the authority of others when he taught, he taught on his own authority. When he healed, he healed by his own authority because he, w- he didn't just claim to be God, but he is God. And lastly, we talked about why we sing. It's this unique experience in the church where we come together to proclaim the truth of God, the, the truth of heaven, the truth that is happening for all eternity in heaven. It's this It's this reality that promotes hope and love and faith, and it's a battle against the evil, greed, hate, and pain of the world. And we wondered, if we can really sing together, what else can we do together? And that's your last blank. If we can sing together, what else can we do together? All right, how'd I do? Was that five minutes? Close? See, if you look back at all of 23 and try to apply it to 2024, I want to propose a sentence to you that could serve as a starting point. But before I do, I just want to acknowledge that, like, to look at it holistically kind of strips out some of the significance that may have happened for some of you. And I know, I know it because I've heard the stories and I've seen it in your face and I've heard it from you, I've heard it from others, that the Holy Spirit worked through this last year, through specific messages. And hold on to that. Let him continue to work in those, in those messages that were uniquely for you. And if we look at this as one sentence, let me just try and read one sentence for you for what I think this last year said. We want to be people who live with the hope, courage, and confidence that we have an incarnate God who is with us through all things, that we would long to be transformed people living reliant upon the Holy Spirit, practicing the way of Jesus in and under his authority and following the selfless sacrificial way of the kingdom seeking to be emotionally healthy personally for the benefit of others, acknowledging that whatever lies ahead in 2024, there's nothing new under the sun, longing for renewal, desiring to be known by what we're for, and unified by the sound of heaven. I feel like it's not, it's not all there, but it's pretty good, right? There are some things in there that we could certainly hold on to and that we could build off of and we could say, this is who I want to be in 2024. And 
I spend a lot of time thinking about writing. I write a ton. I've spent a lot of time thinking about communication. And one of the things that I think about often is don't say something in two words when you can say it with one. So I'm going to give you an even simpler sentence. People who are courageous, transformed, emotionally healthy, disciples of Jesus, aware of the vapor, seeking renewal, known by what we're for, and unified by the sound of heaven. Hopefully that's what your handout says. I made a slide for you if you want, like the whole thing put together. And I thank you that some of you are taking pictures. We'll leave it up for a bit. But the point of the handout is to take it and to remember. And maybe there's one word on there for you this year. Maybe there's one word that God is saying, I want you to, I want you to focus on this one. Maybe it's all of them. I don't know. But what if this was a starting point for us as Calvary Church for 2024? How would it affect who we are? How would it affect how we respond to whatever tomorrow holds? How would it affect all the areas of our lives? What kind of spouse would you be or employee would you be? Parent, student, voter, friend? How might it change the priorities and preferences that you have? How would it change what your calendar looks like? or your bank account? How might it impact your day-to-day? And I know it's, it's easy to throw out big sentences and big ideas like this, but how do, we, how do we even begin to do this? And not coincidentally, the way we started this year is very applicable in answering that question because we started 2023, January 1st, 2023, in this room all together, one service, kids, students, families. We prayed together, we worshiped together, and Dale introduced this idea called the prayer of indifference. It's there on your handout, but it expresses the fact that we have come to a place where we want the way and will of God. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And indifference can sound negative. It can sound like not caring. It can sound apathetic, but from a spiritual perspective, it can be significant. Because what indifference says is your way, your will, not mine. It means that we long for God's way and his will more than our personal comfort, more than our, more than our own preferences. It means that we long for God's way and God's will more than the perception of others. It means that we long for God's way and will to pull us out of the current of culture. It means that we long for God's way and will to anchor us in the tide of the time that pulls us that causes us to drift. Another way of saying it is that prayer of indifference is a prayer to align with the way of God and to ask for his help to cling to foundational elements of life that help to love him and love others and to forget about the things that don't. It's a prayer to ask him to define who we are and who he wants us to be. See, I think if we want to be people who live with the hope, courage, and confidence that we have in incarnate God who is with us through all things, that we would long to be transformed, living reliant upon the Holy Spirit, practicing the way of Jesus in and under his authority and following the selfless, sacrificial way of the kingdom, seeking to be emotionally healthy, personally for the benefit of others, acknowledging that whatever lies ahead in 2024, there's nothing known to the sun, longing for renewal, desiring to be known by what we're for, unified by the sound of heaven, it's going to take more than our own way and will. It's going to take the way and will of God and his power and his assistance to make it happen. It's going to take regularly surrendering our own priorities to his. And I think that this this prayer is a way to begin to do that. So I want to read it once first because I'm going to invite us to pray it together. But I want you to I want you to just read it once and consider is this something that I want to pray out loud this morning with my church, something that I want to invite in my life along with my community. And so I'm going to read it once, and then I'm going to invite you to pray it with me if you want. Father, I give myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. Whatever you may do, I thank you. Help me to be ready for all this year has for me. Help me to accept all that this year has for me. Let only your will be done in me. I wish no more than this. Into your hands I commend my soul. I offer this to you with all the love of my heart. 
For I love you, Lord, and desire to give myself into your hands without reservation and with boundless confidence. For you are my Father. Amen. If this is something you want to pray, and it's okay if you don't, I understand. It's a bold prayer. But if it is something that you want to pray, I would invite you to stand. And I would invite you to hold out your hands like this. I know you're holding, it, I know you're holding your card in one hand, but with your other hand like this. Because it's an, it's an invitation to surrender. It's an invitation to be open to God. So if you want to pray this prayer, let's pray this together. Father, I give myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. Whatever you may do, I thank you. Help me to be ready for all this year has for me. Help me to accept all that this year has for me. Let only your will be done in me. I wish no more than this. Into your hands I commend my soul. I offer this to you with all the love of my heart. For I love you, Lord, and I desire to give myself into your hands without reservation and with boundless confidence. For you are my Father. Amen. Amen. I know that we give you a lot of prayers. We gave you one last Sunday, and and maybe you put it somewhere. But it's because we believe that prayer is powerful. We believe that prayer makes a difference. And we believe that when we pray things alongside one another, it has even more impact. And so I encourage you to take this and put it somewhere where you will see it this year. And let it just serve as a starting place. At a minimum, let it serve as a starting place for your conversation with God and invite him to do what only he can do in your life this year.